Thank you. Um, I'm Nicole Zeno, and I'm from the U University of Washington. And today I'm going to talk about quantifying joystick activation and path navigation um, during power mobility use in toddlers. And this was done in collaboration um, with my collaborators at University of Washington. So on time power mobility, and this has been talked about a lot at this conference, specifically self-initiated mobility at a young age is really critical for development, both cognitive, visual, um, and motor. Um, and there's often the stigma and fear that providing power mobility at this time, um, specifically during toddler's age of one to three, um, can interfere with other skills such as walking. And because they have then limited access to the self-initiated mobility, it can allow cause these kids to have missing opportunities for age appropriate exploration and play, um, which has then been shown to lead to decreased motivation and passive peer interactions. So what are the options for power mobility for toddlers right now? And this is specifically in the United States. So there's the WYSIWYG and Bugsy, which are unfortunately not available in the United States, um, but they are for this age group. And then there's Go Baby Go cars, which are modified ride-on cars that are kind of as an ad hoc solution to fill this gap. Um, and they are available in the US and they are for the age group, um, but it's not a long-term solution. It's trying to fill that gap. And then there's pediatric power wheelchairs, which are not for this young age group. They're very large, very heavy, um, compared to the size of a 20 pound toddler. And then there's the Explore Mini, which is what our study is using, which is available in the US recently, um, and is for this age group of one to three year olds. So Go Baby Go and others have laid a lot of the groundwork um, on this uh, research supporting on-time mobility. So it was affordable, accessible, and on-time power mobility options. And it has shown time and time again to increase peer interaction and play. Um, and they have also shown feasibility of power mobility for as young as six months. And if anybody was in the talk this morning on cognition, this all motivates a lot more of providing access at these times. So now looking at the Explorer Mini, um, some key uh, parts of it are that it offers more independent control. There's directional steering, proportional speed control, multiple speed options, and it has a small turning radius. And one key feature that makes it um, stand out from the ad hoc solutions of the uh, modified ride on cars is that it has steering, not steering. It has, well, it does have steering. Um, those do not have steering, so it's not self initiated mobility. And the other one is that it has seated and standing postures. Um, and so this is a key focus of my work. So standing power mobility for toddlers has been done before. Um, and it has often been theorized to allow a child to simultaneously work on body structure and function goals, but this has not really been, uh, this has all been a theory. So now we're trying to apply that. Um, and there was one study using a Go Baby Go car that was modified to activate when a child stands. And this led to less solitary play and more peer interaction uh, when compared to their regular mode of mobility, which was forearm crutches. And so it really shows that this is possible in this young age group. So the goal of this study was to quantify how toddlers use power mobility in seated and standing postures. We're really focusing on the device, child and environment interaction and relationship. So the participants in the study were toddlers with any mobility disability or delay. They were between one and three years of age and they were able to sit with support. Um, this was actually part of a larger study where they came in for 12 visits, but we're gonna be looking at just the four, first four visits because they had this unique structure. The first play session was 15 to 20 minutes and they were either in seated or standing in a randomized order. Then they took a break, sometimes a snack. Um, and then they had a second play session in which it was in the other posture. So each day they did both postures. And these were all child-led, they were exploratory and play-based, but we also guided our interaction by the assessment of learning power mobility use or ALP tool. And so I just wanna show how we did the seated and standing postures. We left the pommel or seat support in place um, for safety reasons. And also not most of the kids would not have been able to do it without the seat in place. And we changed the knee angle. So going aiming for a 90, about 90 degree angle at the knee in the seated and then closer, but not 180 degrees at the knee in the standing posture. 
So this was our exploratory play environment. It was in our mocap or motion capture space, but we tried to make it as fun as we could. There are later editions of having uh, pictures on the walls uh, that the kids' characters were picked out. And so the play sessions were really exploratory and child-led, but we guided our and based our interaction off of the ALP and the guideline for introducing power mobility to infants and toddlers, which there have already been a few talks today about using this tool. So what were our measures? We were lucky enough to partner with Lucy through their sandbox initiative and program to put sensors and build a custom sensor suite to put inside our Explorer Mini. We're able to get jo joystick activations from custom sensing. We're able to get distance traveled speed and acceleration from encoders on the wheels. And then we're able to get body weight support and loading from load cells in the base. So these are my results that we're going to go over, and I'll come back to this at the end, but I just want you to kind of know what's coming. So our participants had a wide variety of disabilities. Um, they range from ages 14 to 28 months of age. They had neurologic conditions, orthopedic and cerebral palsy. Um, and the mobility at the start of the study really ranged. We had kids who were laying, working on rolling, sitting, um, cruising, and then some one that was starting to walk and walking. So I just want to first start with the workspace of the joystick. To orient you with this figure, forward is up, backward is down, and then left and right. And so this is just three kids over their four, four visits. And again, each visit had two play sessions. So that's why there's a total of eight boxes of their workspace in the, uh, with the joystick. There were some pumping motions, as you can see in P3 in the second visit and the third visit. Um, and then you can see with P2, they often went to, they, they started just in like up and down and side to side, and then they started exploring all of the space and really used the edge of the workspace. Then P7 had a lot of midline and very small, much jerkier movements in the joystick, but started to explore more of the workspace as time went on. But that's a lot of pretty figures. So let's talk about what that actually looks like. So we divided the uh, joystick into six quadrants to see where they were spending their time. So for example, this is just P2. They started exploring all different directions and increased the amount of time they spent in each quadrant. Um, and by the end of the four sessions, they were mainly going forward with some maneuvering and backing up. Toddlers love walls is all I can say. <laughs> so now looking at all of the kids. The most common direction was forward for three of them, and the most common direction was backward for four of them. I think it's really important to note that the three kids with CP were in the backwards group. So this was 100%. They didn't want, maybe they weren't trying to go backwards, but it was motor control dependent. So now looking at activations of the joystick, we defined an activation or about from when the joystick was moved away from neutral and then until it was released and went back to neutral. On average, they activated 681 times in a session, um, ranging from as little as 23 all the way up to 1,300 activations in a session. But how long were these activations? 93% of them were short, really, really short, less than a second. Four of them were longer than two seconds, or 4%, and then 2% of them were longer than five seconds. Um, and to give you a reference of how long those were, the long ones, they range anywhere from 30 seconds all the way up to a few minutes. As you guys know, toddlers, that was spinning. <laughs> so now looking at the posture differences. As a reminder, this is what our seated and standing postures looked like. So this is comparing seated and standing posture joystick, um, the number of driving bouts and their longest driving bouts. So on average, participants had 10% more bouts in the standing posture. And only two of the participants actually had less bouts in the standing posture. And this also correlated to longer bouts in that posture. So, I mean, those, the amount of bouts and the length of the bouts does relate because they have a set amount of time that they're in the device. So now looking at navigation, how were they driving? Where were they driving? So participants drove shorter distances in the seated posture of 29.6 meters on average. And compared to the standing posture, this was about 36.5 meters on average. And so these plots is not going to be just meters, it's meters per minute. 
because depending on the day, depending on the child, it was not always a perfect 15 uh, minute session. If anybody has ever worked with toddlers before, you know why. So it was quite variable. This group of participants were pre, they increased for the most part in both postures. Um, and then P4 was pretty constant in both postures of the, their navigation. Uh, this group was all over the place in both postures. Um, and for reference of their distance traveled, this ranged from 2.4 meters in a session to 190 meters in a session. Lots of laps that day. So now we're looking at loading. So we had the load cells in the base so we could see how much time they're actually spending putting weight through their feet. So right now in this plot, you're looking at loading over 18% of their body weight. So we are trying to take out what their legs just resting on the base um, is accounting for and just looking at how much are they actually pushing and putting weight through their legs. So on average, loading through the base for the seated posture was six to 18%. So most of the time, they're not putting a lot of weight through. Um, and then zero to 12 for standing. But the maximum loading ranged from 27 to 91% of their body weight. There's also a tray in the place. So they were basically supporting themselves in those situations. Um, but on average, participants had greater loading through the foot plate and the seated posture. This is counterintuitive. This is not what you would expect. But biomechanically, when their knees are in that bent position and they have all that space underneath them, they're able to push through. And usually it was to reach for a toy or to reach for something else, but they were able to push through. So now we wanna know how much time were they spending over that threshold, not just how much were they loading. So time spent over that threshold ranged from zero seconds for, them, for some kids in sessions all the way up to eight and a half minutes. So that's half of the time that they were in the driving session. The average time for loading though was 2.1 minutes in seated and 1.8 minutes in standing. So again, it's gonna be a variable figure, so I'm gonna walk you through it. So uh, P, P3 um, <laughs> increased uh, the amount of time that they were loading their legs in both postures. This group was had a much higher loading time, but it also varied from session to session. And I know specifically that first session and standing for the yellow participant P2 was because he was trying to stand and get out of the device. <laughs> it was his first time. Um, and then this participant was variable in the seated session, but was pretty constant at about just one minute of loading in the standing session. And then these last two participants were pretty constant and rarely went above a minute of loading. So now back to that checklist. So looking at the jo joystick workspace exploration, forward and backward were the most common directions. For joystick activations, on average, there were 681 times per session with 93% of these being less than a second. And now looking at the posture differences, for joystick activations, there were more in the standing posture, shorter distances were traveled in the standing posture, and then for body weight support, on average, there were higher loads in the seated posture. So now that we've looked at all of the data, let's look at how they were actually interacting with that joystick, not just that it was being interacted with. Um, so it ranged from one finger, to a hand, to both hands with a supporting hand, to a face, to a mouth. All different ways to activate a joystick for a toddler. So now going over the results, all participants were able to use and interact with the Explorer Mini. We were able to quantify joystick control, navigation, and body weight loading, which is key to improving access to on-time mobility for these kids. Um, and short bouts of exposure were feasible. They were able to learn with just, could be an intervention. And then participants were able to load weight through their legs in both seated and standing postures because of the way the pommel is, of that there's their space underneath, but also especially for the little kids when, it, when they're in the standing position, the pommel can spread their legs apart because they're tiny. And so this is one of the first studies to look at the human device interaction of self-initiated power mobility for toddlers. Um, and on-time power mobility is great for kids on any timeline. We had kids who will be power wheelchair users, and we had kids who were walking or will walk. Um, and they all had benefits and were able to use the device. And as you can expect, the Explorer Mini provides an option to sit and stand, 
but the pommel really acts as a seat in most scenarios. So we are doing future work on evaluating the standing posture without the pommel. Again, this is not, most of the kids are not able to do this, but for the ones that are, we are really interested in this direction. And so I wanna thank my funding sources. I wanna thank Lucy for their help um, as long as my team, and I'll take any questions.